Well, good afternoon. Today is the 23rd of February, 2020. Uh, this is Jay Waters with the Voices of Freedom Project and the Americans in Wartime Museum. We're in Crystal City, Virginia, as part of the Desert Storm uh, 7th Corps Reunion Weekend. And it's my pleasure to do an interview today with Colonel Retired Mark Rado, a longtime friend and colleague. And uh, Mark, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Jay. How are you today? Great, great. And if you would, just for the record, if you could just give us your full name and your, your hometown of birth. My full name is Mark Anthony Rado, and I was born in Yonkers, New York. Okay. And what month and year were you born? March 1957. Okay, and just for the record here too, we are also collaborating this weekend with our colleagues up at the Army Heritage Education Center, and so this interview will be shared with them as well, just so yes, I'm that, aware. get that on the record. And uh, what, what combat uh, wars or conflicts did you participate in? I participated in Operation Desert Shield, Desert Storm, and also Operation Iraqi Freedom. Okay, and we'll come, and we'll come back in, in a lot more detail on those in a few minutes. Um, but thinking back to your, 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 your parents and, and brothers and sisters or uncles or even grandparents um, uh, through your family, think back of any other folks that you had that served in the military and, and if so, if you could just tell us a little bit about them. My father and uh, his brother both served in the military. My dad was drafted into the Army in 1942, uh, served until 1945. Uh, got out, went to work in New York as a, but he, his, his uh, civilian employment was, he was in the very early days of computers. He was a, uh, a, a initially a key punch operator, which is what he did in the Army. Uh, he was a key punch operator in the Army, and he was assigned to machine record units. Um, and then in 1950, Dad got recalled to active duty. Uh, spent about another 14 or 15 months in the Army and then was, uh, was, was discharged again in 1951. His brother had a very similar pattern. Uh, brother was drafted uh, into the Army Air Corps, um, spent times as a crew chief on B-24s, and then um, again separated from the Army after World War II was over. And then um, Army Air Corps, and then um, got recalled to the Air Force okay. in 1950-51 time frame. Um, and uh, uh, I was going to say something else about my dad. Now I can't remember what it was, but uh, both of them uh, were both of them served in those two periods of conflict. My cousins, uh, my uncle's sons, both served uh, one in the Marine Corps. I'm sorry. One in the Navy, my cousin Joel served in the Navy, and my cousin Johnny served in the Air Force. And on my mother's side of the house, my, my, uncle, my uncle Joe served in the Marine Corps as well as his brother. My uncle uh, Manny both served in the Marine Corps. So um, significant service. Uh, yeah. no, no career members, but bo both, both significant service on both sides of the family. But yeah, some definitely some great examples and, and, and previous generations serving and, and serving Absolutely. the country. Yeah, no, that's that's good. Uh, so switching gears a little bit, so think back to September 11th, 2001, attack on the Pentagon and the Twin Towers, attack on America. Where were you that day? Uh, kind of what were you doing? And if you would just elaborate on uh, your, your day that day and your emotions and feelings about what happened that day. I was assigned as the executive officer to the Commanding General of the United States Army Recruiting Command, then Major General Dennis Cavan. And we were, he was actually in Indianapolis. He went to Indianapolis that day to visit the Indianapolis Recruiting Battalion with his driver. I was left back in the office uh, with the rest of the team. Uh, we were watching the television um, and uh, in comes our, one of the majors I worked with the, uh, at the SGS, and she said, hey, guy just flew an airplane into uh, the, the World Trade Center. And uh, before long, we turned on the news. Uh, we turned on the news in, in the general's office. She was watching it in the chief's office. We turned on the news mm -hmm. in the general's office, and then I called him on the phone in Indianapolis um, and, and told him what happened. Um, 
we then continued watching the news and I was actually on the phone with him a second time when we were, I had the, uh, I was listening to, I guess, NBC and Jim, Jim Miklaszewski was on TV for reporting from the Pentagon with Katie Cork and Kate, Jim Miklaszewski says, hey Katie, hold on one second. Uh, there's some commotion out in the hallway and he comes back on, on the air and he announced that the second plane hit the Pentagon. So as soon as I told the general that the second plane, I'm sorry, the second plane hit the World Trade Center, as soon as I told the general that the second plane hit the World Trade Center, he, he said, hey, this is absolutely terrorism at this point. Mm -hmm. um, and it was just sobering because uh, b before long, I'm sorry, I was right the first time. Jim Lukashevsky was on the phone with Katie Cork, um, was on the air with Katie Cork, when the, when the plane hit the Pentagon, mm -hmm. yeah. I was on the phone with the general um, after, uh, after the second uh, plane hit right, the uh, right. World Trade Center. So I'm sorry, I kind of yeah, boogered that up. Confused you, a crazy yeah. day. Uh, yeah. It was, it was a crazy day. And uh, um, having, especially knowing that at, at that point in time, Army Recruiting Command was a major subordinate command of the G1. And so our higher headquarters at that point in time from Fort Knox was the Pentagon. And so at that point, trying to reach out to uh, the office of the G1, General Maud, uh, folks that worked there, uh, colleagues, friends, uh, yeah. just, you know, it was just, uh, it was just a horrible day, um, and one that you and I both lost great friends and colleagues yeah. in, yeah. and uh, one that was just um, yeah, a day that we'll never ever forget, and you know, a horrible experience for us all, and it changed the world that day. Yeah, no, absolutely. And then it was it was it was painful in a way too to hear first that the Pentagon was hit, which was bad enough, but then to find out that the the G one area, the uh, our area was was the area specifically hit. Absolutely. But was there anything unusual that happened at Fort Knox specifically, uh, <clears throat> like force protection measures or anything at? at uh, Knox? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the starting the next day, uh, extra security, extra extra scrutiny at, at all of the gates. Of course, you know we all know, you know the the timeline that you know, just increased time to get to the get to the office. So uh, just uh, armed guards. Uh, multiple armed guards at each of the gates with uh, rifles and mm. long guns and machine guns and so um, it was just uh, you know, all important things all you know precautions that needed to be taken uh, but as I mentioned it, it changed it changed yeah. the world we lived in that day How'd your boss get back from Indianapolis? Though? That was uh, that was a <laughs> long ride back from Indianapolis. Oh, he drove back. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We, it was uh, from Fort Knox to Indy, a couple hour drive. Um, okay. Interestingly enough, uh, years later, uh, I'm in uh, I'm in a Five Guys in St. Petersburg, Florida, and I'm waiting for my order. I'm ordering my hamburger. I'm waiting for my order. I start talking to the fellow behind the counter, uh, one of the guys, and and. I must have been wearing an army shirt or an army ball cap or something, and we got talking about the army. And he, he, he was he had served in the army, and you know he had served in Indianapolis recruiting battalion, and he had served in Indianapolis recruiting battalion headquarters, and was there on 9/11, the day General Cavan was there. Oh, okay. So we had this entire conversation damn, about damn. all of the things that happened that day, and the thing, you know, and and both from his perspective on that side and the Indianapolis side, my perspective, and back in the headquarters of Fort Knox. <coughs> Just, you know, again, shows you how small the world oh, is. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Well, well, Mark, now back to you specifically, and we're gonna kind of start at the beginning. So why did you join the military? So talked about my dad um, uh, as being, and as you mentioned, a significant role model, a significant influence in my life in terms of being in the military uh, or wanting to be in the military. Uh, my dad uh, was, uh, he taught me the, to, to, you know, the, the value of the freedom that we have in this country. He taught me about um, that, you know, that of our duty to serve, our duty to give back to our country. Um, he taught me to respect the flag. He taught me to respect the country, respect the leadership of the country. Um, I can remember uh, one time as a kid uh, getting in trouble in school because I was talking uh, during the Pledge of Allegiance instead of 
reciting the Pledge of Allegiance and with my hand held over my heart and, and looking over at the flag. And I can tell you that of all the, um, of all of the uh, um, incidents where I would get in trouble at school, that one had the highest repercussion that mm. day. There was no question about it because uh, he, he reminded me that he served in two wars and he reminded me what this country and what the symbol of this country, our flag, means and the proper respect we should pay to it. Um, his words were perhaps a little bit more forceful that day. Right. But that was the, me the message got through clearly. Okay. That's and I always wanted to be a soldier. Yeah. So from that point on, I always wanted to be a soldier. And I, I wanted to serve our nation. And, uh, and I tried to, you know, I tried to get into, you know, West Point uh, in high school. And I, you know, didn't have the grades. I was having too much fun talking during the Pledge of Allegiance, <laughs> I guess. But um, I uh, just, and then I was in Air Force ROTC while I was in college. And that was moving in the right direction. But then I got distracted in another uh, venue. I decided I was going to, I wanted to be a teacher and a coach and I was going to have to take some extra classes and I was going to have to give up the ROTC. But, um, okay, so uh, then the, the teacher and coach thing worked out. I was, that's exactly what I was doing for a while. Made my, ended up making my way back to New York at some point. I gave up teaching, went back to New York. And one day, a couple of years into being back in New York, I just happened to wander into a recruiter's office and just started talking about rec opportunities. I was uh, 27 at the time. And um, one thing led to another thing, and one, rec one challenges, challenges with the recruiter led to another, more challenges with another recruiter, and make a long story short, um, two years later I, I joined the Army. I was a 28-year-old private, and then went to, uh, I went to uh, basic training at Fort Knox, Kentucky, and then, um, Graduated from basic training and went on to uh, went off to uh, officer candidate school, and I was a 29 year old second lieutenant. So I got got a little got a little started a little late in the game, but uh, I was fulfilling a dream. Um, I had, it was uh, I often tell this story that I uh, when I finally made the commitment that I was going to join the army, I enlisted at the uh, at the MEP station. Um, and I went into the delayed entry program. It was in January of 1985, and I wasn't gonna, going to assess into the Army until October of 1985. So I quit my job in Manhattan. I wasn't <laughs> about to start, you know, do, continue to do the commuting thing. Um, and I decided I would just go ahead and get a job waiting tables and hang out and have a little fun, make a little money, and wait to you know, work out, get ready for the Army, and do just that. Well, um, one thing led to another. One table, one job waiting tables led to another job waiting tables, and I was in a small waiting tables in a small restaurant in Long Island, where I where I'm from, actually right in my my hometown in Carl Place. And uh, one day, one of the owners comes in and says, "Yeah, we really like you. We think you would make a really good restaurant manager versus a waiter." So I'm like, "Oh wow, yeah, that's a great idea because that's exactly what I want to do. I'd love to wait table. I'd love to be a restaurant manager." So there I am, starting to as my new career as a restaurant manager at the West End Cafe in Carl Place, a small, independently owned restaurant, which, oh, by the way, 33 years later is still there and still independently owned. Um, and, uh, and I was having a ball. And it was getting to be September, and I was having to think about here real soon that I have to tell these folks I'm leaving but I've got this great job, I'm making pretty good money, I'm having a lot of fun, and starting to think, May maybe I won't join the Army. Well, you know, I was getting a little bit closer, and I got to be about 1st of October, and I said, you know what, I'm 28 years old, and if I don't join the Army now, I'm going to be too old to join the Army, yeah. and I don't want to have to wake up one day and said, I would have, I should have, I could have. Yeah. So I went in that day and I told my bosses that I had joined the Army and I was leaving uh, on October 15th and the rest is history, there as they go. say. Well, so when you actually enlisted, though, um, in basic training, was it specifically for an OCS option? It was. I, I had, uh, contract, so by, the time, by the time, uh, now when I had first enlisted in January, um, the, uh, the OCS contract hadn't come through yet. So I was actually 
uh, con I was actually contracted for an 11 Bravo uh, one station unit training at Fort Benning, Georgia. And then while I was in the delayed entry program, I continued my OCS application and before I shipped to basic training, uh, my OCS uh, packet came was approved. And then so they renegotiated my contract from an 11 Bravo one station unit training contract to a 09 Sierra basic combat training contract. And like I said, went to basic combat training at Fort Knox, Kentucky on 15 October 1985. So does it, do you have any, any specific thing that really stands out from either the basic training at Fort Knox or the OCS? Well, the, being, being the oldest guy in my platoon, that was certainly a unique situation. Uh, there I was at 28, and um, you know, I'm with young soldiers, 17 years old, uh, 18 years old, 19 years old, um, and you know, they're... They have 17-year-old and 18-year-old and 19-year-old issues. Yeah. You know, they can't b believe that they joined the Army and they don't, they're not with their girlfriend anymore. And, you know, oh, I really miss my friends from school and I miss my car and all these things. And I became dad. I became <laughs> the father confessor. You know, they all ended up at the foot of my bunk, you know, telling me their woes. But... There was nobody for me to tell my woes to, you know. I, yeah. I mean, I missed. I didn't, didn't have a girlfriend, but I certainly missed my car, and I missed my nice New York City life and my nice restaurant manager job, and mm. I missed my parents too. But there was nobody for me to tell my woes to. So, but, uh, but it was fun. I and mean, the, uh, I was in. I was without question in, <coughs> in my the best physical shape I could have been in to start basic training. So okay. physically, it wasn't it wasn't tough. I had gotten ready for it. Um, yeah, you know, there was a. I, I I can remember the first time on the confidence course, and climbing the uh, tower, and I can remember turning to one of my buddies saying, "I am confident. I don't want to do this, but we did it, and uh, graduated from basic training. I had a I had a great bunk mate, a uh, great great uh, great uh, squad mate uh, by the name of Jack Esworthy. Jack and I uh, met the night we um, the night we got to Louisville. For, uh, we flew from, uh, I personally flew from LaGuardia Airport in New York City to Louisville, Kentucky. Um, got there and I met about 200 of my new closest friends, uh, privates from all over. We were waiting for the buses. Um, and so while I'm waiting, I'm walking around and I see this guy wearing a Shippensburg University, oops, Shippensburg University sweatshirt. Hey, is that Shippensburg in uh, Sealings Grove, Pennsylvania? Oh, yeah, it is. I said, oh, I went to Wilkes. Oh, I, yeah. where are you from? He goes, oh, I'm from Long Island. I said, where are you from? Oh, I'm from uh, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. <clears throat> I said, really, what high school did you go to? He goes, oh, I went to Central Dauphin. I said, oh, I used to teach at Bishop McDevitt, the, the local Catholic high school mm -hmm. in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. So we knew all sorts of friends, and we became fast pals, and we're still friends to this day. Uh, so I had, had great teammates like him and a uh, young private who was no kid and 17 years old named Scott Krause who I'm still friends with to this Great. day as well. Right. And as uh, a matter of fact, he came to my retirement ceremony well, when I retired go. from the Army, along with two other of my guys, from, uh, friends from my platoon, my basic training platoon. So, so that was the, the teamwork, the, com you know, the camaraderie, right. had, that helped you get through, no doubt about it. Well, and then completion upon OCS, you became a second lieutenant. Were you branched initially AG, or were you something else? I was not. I was initially, well, I was initially branched infantry. I mm -hmm. said, okay, well, I'm going to go back. You know, I, I, like I said, I had been contracted for an 11 Bravo position, and... Um, I thought, you know, I'm going to go be an infantry officer. So, uh, and my, my buddy Jack, I mentioned earlier, Jack got branched armor. And um, and so I said, well, I think, you know, I think I'd like to be an armor officer too, if Jack's going to be an armor officer. So I did a branch transfer, and we were able to do that in uh, at OCS. We were able to branch transfer while we were still at OCS. And I got I got selected to go to armor, so I became an armor. I was branched originally an armor officer upon graduation from Officer Canada School, and I went to uh, the armor officer basic course at Fort Knox, Kentucky, in I guess uh, May of uh, 1985. 
I'm sorry, May of 1986. Yeah, so, so Knox to, to OCS and then back to Knox. Then back to Knox. And so then as we, as we move along here, we won't necessarily go blow by blow all of your assignments, but let's just talk about then your, your first duty assignment after training as a second lieutenant. Where'd you go and what was that like? I went to uh, the 24th Infantry Division at uh, Fort Stewart, Georgia, um, part, of the, uh, uh, part of the 18th Airborne Corps. And um, I was uh, blessed to uh, have the opportunity to spend about three or four months on the staff before I went right into a tank platoon, waiting for a tank platoon to open. So I went into the S4 shop, uh, worked for a captain by the name of John Babs, just a really nice gentleman who uh, took the time to teach, coach, and mentor. And um, had a great, the, the, uh, his boss, the, the battalion XO, was a great American by the name of then Major and soon to be Lieutenant Colonel and then ultimately Colonel Bud Schatzer. Um, Bud Schatzer was, uh, he was everybody's friend. Uh, his nickname in the battalion was Uncle Bud. And uh, he was a phenomenally talented officer who really kind of gave me my first taste of of uh, how to, you know, a different style of leadership. It didn't always have to be the authoritative, the pointed, it, you know, it could be a, a less invasive style of leadership to be successful. And that's exactly what he was. Um, and the, uh, the cool thing about that is that later on, life, later on in life as a civilian, Bud Schatzer ended up working for me and the Assistant Secretary of the Army for Manpower Reserve oh, Affairs. Wow. So it was pretty cool. But, was he um, still a nice guy when the tables absolutely, were reversed? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Just well, then a, he's a true gentleman. Just a prince. As a matter of fact, I just talked to him the other night. That's awesome. He's getting ready to retire from the Army. I just talked to him when I got back to town here. But that was a great assignment. Uh, I had a phenomenal platoon sergeant. My platoon sergeant was Sergeant First Class Leonard Adams. Sergeant Adams had been uh, a tank platoon sergeant in Germany um, when the M1 tank first rolled off the assembly line, and they were first uh, they were first fielded in Germany, and he knew every inch of that M1 tank. He knew, and he, most importantly, he knew the value of maintenance, and he he stressed maintenance with the with the platoon, um, and we just had a phenomenal experience. He and I got along very well. Uh, he let he taught. He taught, coached, and mentored me uh, to be uh, to be a, a, a fine officer, and he you know explained to me when I was doing right, and he made sure I didn't do wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I tell you, the, the the best thing about Sergeant Adams, again, as I mentioned, he understood maintenance. He understood. He knew every inch of that M1 tank. He had been he had been on the new equipment uh, training, uh, new equipment t uh, team. As we received when they received the new uh, new tanks in Germany, so he knew every single inch of that tank. And okay. um, the best, the most important aspect of that became when we went to the National Training Center. Um, in fast forward through a, a year plus of my experience with him as a tank platoon sergeant, and we in August of 1988, we went to the National Training Center, and uh, we started the rotation with four tanks, and we finished the rotation with four tanks. And we were the only platoon in the entire brigade that f road marched four tanks back into the Dust Bowl at the end of the rotation. In fact, of all of, uh, you know, all of the operations in the desert for that rotation, there was only one that my tank platoon didn't start with all four tanks. And the one <laughs> the one, um, the one rotation, one, the one in the battle that we went in and we fought, we started with only three tanks. The fourth tank came up during the battle and actually, actually came was able to come up, provide me covering fire. Uh, I am, I am, I'm, I'm down. I'm, I'm, I'm in defilade. I can't get out uh, because I just, I know there's a, there's, there's another tank, right? I know there's an op four guy, you know, right in front of me, and I can't move, and I can't move, and all of a sudden, I hear. Blue one, this is blue four. I was like, where are you? He said, look around, turn around. And I turned around, I'll be darned if that guy wasn't hauling ass across the desert floor right on his way. And he was able to come up, provide covering fire for me, got me out of there, and we ended up winning that battle there too. You go. So Just in time. Combat it was, power. no doubt about it. Well, so I know uh, from, from knowing you later in your career, you became an AG officer. So when did that happen and what was the, the, the story behind that, becoming an AG? So in um, in April, I'm sorry, October of 1988, um, I got married, 
And the uh, woman I married at the time was also an army officer, and she had just gotten reassigned, been re she had just been reassigned to Germany as a, uh, she was a um, um, preventive, ma preventive medicine officer. And uh, she was assigned to the hospital, I think it was 34th General Hospital in, in Augsburg, Germany. So I called, you know, TAPC, Total Army Personnel Command, or TAPA, Total Army Personnel Agency, whatever it was called at that point, yeah. uh, in 1988, and said, "Hey, I'm getting ready to get married, and I, you know, and, you know, my wife's going to Germany, and I want to, you know, go with her." Well, you know, we'll see what we can do. So, sure enough, uh, get a call. They're going to send me to the uh, first um, infantry division forward. Um, General Rain was talking about that last night mm -hmm. during his brief, that we had a brigade in Germany, first infantry division forward, and I'm going to be a tank platoon leader. So, great. Everything worked out good. I started getting ready to go. Uh, October of 88, I PCS to Germany. Uh, while I'm here, I'm, on leave. I'm in Germany for about three weeks. I take some, I take some leave before I signed in. My wife and I go off to uh, visit the battalion. So I get to the battalion headquarters, and they're like, oh, Lieutenant Rado, we're thrilled to have you, and you know, here's what we're going to do with you. You're going to go down to Charlie Company. You're going to be an XO. Or you're going to be a, a tank platoon leader in Charlie Company for a while. Then we're going to make you an XO for a while, and you know, it's going to be great. We really you know, had got a good report from your former battalion commander, Bud Schatzer. Um, you, you know, we're looking forward to you getting here. Uh, it's going to be great. I'm like, okay, super. So I go back to Augsburg, where she was assigned, finish up my leave. On the 1st of November, I report in. Hey, Lieutenant Rado, um, yeah, we got an opportunity here. We have to send a lieutenant over to the 7th Corps headquarters to be the company XO for the HHC there. Uh, we, thought, we thought we'd let you uh, give you, offer it to you, see if you might want to go over there. So back in those days, if you recall, um, we had the force alignment program where at, uh, after f three years as a lieutenant, uh, you took all your combat arms officers where you need a whole lot more lieutenants and you looked at their files and you, get, you, you, you uh, involuntarily branch transferred them into a career field that needed more captains. So typically they were the adjutant general mm -hmm. corps, mm -hmm. it was the uh, Quartermaster Corps, Transportation Corps, uh, Military Intelligence, and there was another one. Um, mm -hmm. mil um, yeah, whatever. So, um, Ordnance, Ordnance Corps. So, um, I figured at that point, I was getting rebranched. I'm like, you know, I'll get promoted to captain, but in my luck, I'm going to get rebranched. So I said, yeah, I'll go to the 7th Corps headquarters. This way, after I do a year as an armor officer there as the XO, you know, I can, get, I can walk into a job in one of my new career fields, whatever it is. So they send me on over there. I report into Kelly Barracks. And um, no kidding, within three or four days of me reporting in, the captain's list comes out. So not only did I get promoted to captain, I did not get rebranched. Ah. To, uh, to another branch, and I, was, I remained an armor officer. So the intent was I was going to do a year as the company XO, and then I was going to go back to the tank battalion. Well, a year goes by, I have a new battalion commander. Right about the same time, the S1, the battalion S1, uh, gets sent home on emergency leave, and the emergency leave turned into an emergency reassignment. Uh, so now there is no battalion S1. So the battalion commander says to me, hey, we're going to bring you up and you're going to be the part-time S1. You'll still be the company XO, but I want you to be the part-time S1 too. So I did that for about a month or so. And then, you know, next thing you know, I wasn't the company XO anymore. I was the full-time S1. And, um, and I was having a ball. So when the second year ends, and they're like, okay, uh, what do you want to do? So, well, I'd like to go back to the tank battalion. So they call up tank battalion. Tank battalion says, yeah, we, you know, we'd love to have him. Um, I'm going to make him a company commander. Okay, great. So I go back over. You know, we're going to Hohenfels. We're going to Graf, whichever one it was. I can't remember. 
Uh, and when we come back from Hovenfels or Graf, you know, we're gonna, I'm going to make him a tank company commander and we're gonna, uh, we'll put him into Charlie Company. Great. So they go to Hovenfels and uh, at this point it's about, you know, sometimes, I guess, December of 90-ish, something around there. Um, yeah, something like that. I'm trying to think if I got the timeline right. But anyway, um, the wall had just come down, and uh, there was this thing called the Peace Dividend. And uh, the, very first infantry, the very first unit to be announced as a drawdown unit in Germany was 1st Infantry Division Forward. So uh, now I have no company command to go to. Um, next thing you know, um, so my boss was going to put, it was an opportunity to go into command in, in, in HHC, in 7th Corps. I was going to take HHC 7th Corps, but 7th Corps had a policy at the time where you couldn't, uh, you couldn't um, take command if you hadn't been to the advanced course, and I hadn't been to the advanced course yet. So then there was a possibility of command over 6th Area Support Group. That one didn't work out. There was a possibility of a command in the Yukon Area Support Group. That one didn't work out. And so uh, by this point in time, it's around August of 1990, and uh, Saddam Hussein decides it would be a great idea to invade Iraq. Uh, I'm sorry, invade Kuwait. And um, next thing you know, Mark Rado, Captain Armor, S Battalion S1 of 7th Corps Special Troops Battalion is on his way to uh, Southwest Asia with 7th Corps <coughs> in support of Operation Desert Shield, Desert Storm. Well, yeah, so let, that's what I was going to ask. We are going to lead into that, so that <laughs> led very well. But so just for clarification, you're still an armor officer. I'm still an armor officer. Masquerading as an S1. Exactly. Okay. And um, at, at the end of, uh, at the end, and I know we'll chat about Operation Desert Shield, Desert Storm, but fast forward to the end of Operation Desert Shield, Desert Storm, and I come back and uh, I get orders to go to the Armor Officer Advance Course. So it is now May of 1991. The last time I had been on a tank was August of 1988. And I'm thinking to myself, there is no way I'm going back to Fort Knox to go to the Armor Officer Advance Course. And having spent, have, have, having spent three years in Germany, and having not stepped foot in Hohenfels, stepped foot in Grafenbeer, there's just no way I'm going to do that. Yeah. So I went to Colonel John Peck, the 7th Corps AG, who I'd gotten to know. And I said, sir, I'd like to branch transfer to the AG Corps. And he said, we'd love to have you. He wrote a letter of endorsement, a letter of recommendation for me, and uh, made a couple of phone calls for me. And uh, I did a 4187. Uh, and... Uh, I got selected for, uh, for to be rebranched to the AG Corps, and I just had a phenomenal. It, it was just the best decision, the best Army decision I made was to go become the AG Corps. And the funny thing about or the, it, was, or some would say the best decision the Army made. Well, that but. that too. But the 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 the, the thing that always kind of made me chuckle about that is, one day I came home and I told my dad in 1985 that I was joining the Army, and the first words out of my dad's mouth was. Were, you need to become an AG. You need to go AG. Hmm. A, you know, AG folks just know what they're doing, and it's the best life you could have in the Army as an AG guy. So when I got selected to be an AG officer, uh, the first call I made was to my dad and told him I finally listened to him. Yeah, so you're, you're finally listened to him. So your dad, who's a World War II and Korea War veteran and was not an AG. He was, actually. Oh, okay, back, okay. back in those days, yeah, okay. the all machine right. record units yeah, were okay, part okay. of okay. the AG Corps. There you go. Well, all right. They so were AG units. So you, yeah. you were kind of following in his footsteps in more ways than one. Absolutely. But So then let's go back to the, the <coughs> Desert Storm. You're the Battalion S1 with 7th Corps STB and uh, in as much detail as you want, but... You know, the alert, you guys were a forward deployed unit already, but now you're being further deployed to Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Iraq. Um, and just kind of talk us through what was going on and how that worked for well, you. Well, it's funny you say that because that's exactly what I always say. I say we were a forward deployed unit in a combat theater of operations, which for all intents and purposes, we were there. We were, we were arrayed in general defense GDP position, general defense uh, position, general defense position, Positions, um, you know, defending Western Europe against communist aggression, um, and 
that threat went away. So they picked us up from a forward deployed position and they deployed us further directly into a combat theater of operations. There were no books for that. Uh, there was no manuals for that. There was nothing written that told us how to do that. And as I've told people throughout my career, that is absolutely one of the highlights of my career is what we did there. Um, you're right. You talk about you know you, the alert. Well, you talked about that the wall had come down already, um, and throughout throughout the world, throughout throughout uh, the free world, parts of the Berlin Wall were being taken from Berlin and being brought to different headquarters uh, throughout both Okona, both uh, overseas and in, in America. You still see them in museums, mm -hmm. big chunks of the Berlin Wall. Uh, but we got a piece of it at, in Stuttgart at Kelly Barracks. And so we um, had, a, we had a, a site erected for the M uh, Berlin Wall Memorial Site. And we were planning a, a ribbon-cutting ceremony and a dedication ceremony for November the 9th. And it was a Friday. Um, November the 8th, uh, we, and that's, I, I was in charge of the, the ceremonial aspect. Uh, the S4 was in charge of the construction and the logistics and such. Um, so I was the, doing all that work, all the administrative work for the ceremony. On top of that, we had a hail and farewell on the night of October, of November the 8th. Um, we're, at, we're leaving the hail and farewell. I looked at my battalion commander and said, sir, as soon as the ceremony's over, tomorrow morning, I'm getting in the car and I'm driving to uh, Garmisch. I had uh, reservations to go to Garmisch, for, actually Birch's Garden. Going to Birch's Garden for the weekend, sir. You won't see me after the ceremony. No problem, Lieutenant Rado. They got the captain by then. Yeah, Captain Rado, no problem. So um, get home that night after the hail and farewell. Couple hour or so goes by, my phone rings, it's my, my PSNCO, uh, my personal services non-commissioned mm -hmm. officer, Staff Sergeant Oral Fountain. He says, hey, sir, are you watching TV? First words out of my mouth are, Sergeant Fountain, I keep telling you, I don't have AFN out here. What's up? He says, sir, we just got alerted, we're going to war tomorrow. We're going to war, it was just on, the a on AFN. So we go in the next day, we do the ceremony, and uh, there was no trip to Birch's Garden. Um, it was just, you know, we were just planning. We were, we were, you know, executing. We were, you know, the personnel piece of it. You know, where are the people? What, how we were going to staff the corps headquarters? Uh, where are the people are going to come from? Augmentees from all over the, all over the army were coming in. Um, there was absolutely, uh, <clears throat> and again, there there was no individual augmentee system like we have today. Um, I, I, to the best of my ability, there was no such thing as a YAS tasker at that point in time. It was all done from manual cross-leveling. I, I know uh, Colonel Jeannie Thornton was just in here, and um, she was uh, the deputy, deputy um, personnel group commander and uh, at the same time. And so I, as a 7th Corps Special Troops Battalion, as a major subordinate command of the 7th Corps, was involved in the same meetings that we were doing up at First Perscom to cross-level soldiers from, from division to division, from brigade to brigade, um, uh, and ensure that the divisions were ready to go, ensure that all the Corps headquarters were ready to go. We went from, oh gosh, I maybe our, the Corps headquarters strength, the Seventh Corps piece, you know, not the not the MPs, not the uh, the, uh, the, the signal brigade guys, but just those that assigned to HHC 7th Corps was about seven or 800. Uh, by the time we, when we reached our top maximum strength in, during the war, we were about 1,800, geograph 1800 soldiers geographically dispersed in three headquarters throughout Southwest Asia, the TAC, the main, and the rear. Uh, was all, and, that, and that's what everything we were doing. We had a, you know, we had to push the, TAC, the tactical command post out First, and they went out in um, November. By late November, the tactical command post was out. Then we pushed the main command post out. They went out right around Christmas. I was one of the last groups to leave because I had to make sure everything was, mm -hmm. all the personnel were properly manifested in our SIDPER system and uh, get them all right, get all the chalks right, get all the flights right. And then 
I was one of the last folks to leave right around, it was early January, like January 9th. I think I left, uh, I drove, we drove from Stuttgart to Rhine-Main Air Force Base. It was my, it was about four or five vehicles, uh, a couple cut Vs, um, the, uh, the Blazer types and a couple pickups yeah. with about 16 soldiers total. In, in, and we got, we put our, put our uh, vehicles on a couple airplanes and off we went. Then uh, we landed in Southwest Asia. I think it was like the 5th of January or the, the 9th of January. Clearly, mm. I, I've got it someplace, but. Sure. Yeah. But. Uh, well, so then, so during your time in, in uh, Desert Shield, which then became Desert Storm, kind of what were you doing on a day to day basis? Just kind of talk us through that and, and also maybe mention the, well, the ground, ground offensive. The, the first part, of course, was, was getting there. Um, we didn't have, and I guess a, a piece that I'd left out in the Germany piece was equipment. I mean, we were, we were just scrambling for equipment, the things we were going to need, whether it was going to be trucks, tentage, lightweight screening systems. I can remember <laughs> there was, as, as, at this point, there were a number of drawdown units announced. Um, uh, and uh, I can remember a buddy of mine was a company XO in Augsburg. And uh, he, had been, he had been my predecessor in the, as the HHC XO. And then he went up... Uh, to Augsburg in a, in a field artillery job, and he was in a drawdown unit as well, and he told me all the stuff they had they could get rid of, and so I took a guy and a deuce and a half, and we drove to Augsburg, and we, you know, six or seven GP mediums, you know, lightweight screening systems, uh, uh, Herman Nelson uh, heaters, just, you know, whatever wasn't nailed down and on somebody's property book, we took. Sure. Um, but now get to the desert, and the first thing, you know, we were in, uh, we were in the port for a while, mm -hmm. and cause, as you might imagine, we were the last of the group from the Corps headquarters. Um, so after about three or four days of, of hoping to make something happen or hoping to get out of there, uh, I can remember we just, you know, got a clearance, and, uh, and I, I told, told my boss we were on our way, and we started driving. And... Um, it got. It was. I, I can't remember everything. I just remember that it was really late, and it was really dark. There yeah. was no illumination, and at some point, I finally said, "Okay, you know, we just can't do this anymore. We got to pull off." And we pulled off, and then all of a sudden, I saw a vehicle coming up alongside of us, and um, I'll never forget it. But it was one of the MP platoon leaders from 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 Kelly Barracks. Uh, they had been sent out to you know to link up with us. And oh, there you go. First, uh, uh, my good friend, First Lieutenant Brian La Brian Adelson, uh, and we just uh, stayed there um, for the night. And then first thing in the morning, we uh, we drove into um, Cobar Towers. We drove to Cobar Towers, and that's uh, where we stayed for another couple of days there until we were able to link up uh, with the rest of the organization, rest of the battalion um, and my battalion commander. And then we moved uh, to our first location, first of two locations. Uh, we moved to the <coughs> first area and there, you know, and there we were, you know, we were setting up tents, setting up trailers, you know, and, and you know, uh, you know kind of like General Rain was alluding to last night in his comments. I mean, you know, the, or actually it was, um, it was, uh, um, General Ray, General Franks, or when he was reading the uh, no, I guess it was General Rame when he was uh, talking about um, Sir Rupert Kelly's uh, General Sir Rupert Kelly's comments about you know being in in a Western European unit in this, in Saudi Arabia with uh, with equipment that didn't match and. Uh, there we were with our green tents and our mm -hmm. green lightweight screening systems and our green vehicles and our green uniforms um, in the desert. So uh, <laughs> it, it was it was a just it was making stuff up. Sure. As as I often tell people, as, as I mentioned earlier, we you know, there was no manual for this. There was no book for this. Uh, we literally were making things up, and as long as it wasn't illegal or immoral or unethical, we were doing it. And um, you know, we were successful. Well, and so what was your unit's role and your role during the actual so, ground campaign? Um, so as the battalion, as the, the, the 7th Corps Special Troops Battalion, 
uh, was responsible for all the administration, administrative operations and logistics of the headquarters. So, you know, we obviously we weren't planning the war, but we were ensuring that the war planners, you know, from the entire core staff, you know, all of their basic life support needs were taken care of. So we were responsible for, you know, all manning all the, for all the repair of the, our, of the vehicles. We were responsible for, um, you know, the, running the, the dining facilities. You know, my particular, I was a battalion S1, um, and so a little bit, I, you know, talk about mission creep. You know, all of a sudden, not only am I taking care of personal accountability, strength reporting, awards, being prepared for casualty reporting, casualty reporting, you know, taking care of all of the traditional S1 functions. But next thing you know, I'm, I'm, I'm the gym guy. Mm -hmm. uh, hey, Captain Rado, um, I want you to set up a gym. So there I was, you know, rummaging through connexes, rummaging through trailers, finding all the gym equipment I can find to make a tent and get a GP medium to set up a gym. Hey, Captain Rado, good job on the gym. Now I want you to set up a PX. So now I had to become, uh, I had to become a uh, an impressed officer, so that I could staff and run a small. Um, I can't remember what we called them. There was a name for the type of PX. It was mobile PX. Yeah, mobile PX. Um, but so and uh, so, you know. Thankfully, <laughs> thankfully, whenever. I <laughs> Thankfully, whenever I got one of these missions, I certainly didn't have the people to do it, but we were very blessed that, um, again, as the generals both alluded to yesterday, General Rame, you know, the casualties were, were minimal. Yeah. Um, but that didn't stop the replacement flow. There were, there were replacements coming in, the shelf replacements were coming in based upon traditional casualty estimates. So I, whenever, and I just happened to be engaged to one of the, at that time, to one of the core strength managers. So she would, I would call up that night and I would say what came in last night and she would tell me what came in and I would go to the replacement company and I would bring, I would load up my truck with whatever I could find, the equipment that I knew the replacement company needed and I would be able to trade equipment for people, yeah. uh, whether it was I can remember he did, and it was a it was a replacement company, a direct support replacement company out of Louisiana, and 84th comes to mind. It might be not, not probably not the right unit designation, but the uh, the uh, company commander was just uh, you know a <coughs> great young guy from uh, from Louisiana. It was a, a reserve unit, USAR unit. And um, you know he had he had a lot of people on his hands because as I mentioned you know casualties were very low replacements were very high uh, but he didn't have a lot of things and so I would just get reach out to him figure out what he needed and I'd go bring it to him and I'd come back with people I can remember I came back one day with a dozen twelve laundry and bath specialists we had no laundry and bath capability but I had laundry and bath specialists and they became guys to run the yeah, soldiers to run the PX, soldiers to run, run the uh, the gym. Um, yeah, we we so had a movie we had a movie yeah, yeah. we had a movie tent. I had to have MWR I had to have soldiers to run the theater. So yeah, the MWR program it was I mean, obviously S one functions, uh, but we weren't resourced for it, and uh, but we did it and it was great. I my impress fund PX was probably one of the best in uh, out there in the middle of nowhere, no doubt about it. Well, you mentioned uh, casualties, Mark. Did you have any instances where you had um, scud attacks or uh, any kind of combat-related action? No, uh, none at all. Thank God. I mean, thank God. It was uh, you know, there was there was absolutely no uh, instances of any you know uh, any operations that got anywhere near sure. the core headquarters okay. at all. So we were very lucky. But no then as, as the S-1, though, I would imagine you still had some casualty reports for uh, non-battle injuries or, or at least injuries. Yeah, not, yeah, not yeah. Yeah, we had a, uh, I remember our battalion sergeant major um, uh, was, was very ill and ended up being evacuated. So we had to, you know, do the casualty reporting for that case. Uh, and then, of course, we needed a new sergeant major. Uh, I think we took him out of the battalion S3 shop, actually. Mm. Good guy, great guy by the name of Frank Kane. 
Yeah. But, um, so for Desert Storm, at least, and, and um, how did you stay in contact with, with family and loved ones back in the, in the States or back in Germany? Um, you know, there was uh, messaging. And, you know, I can't even remember what the messages were called. I just remembered you used to get like a strip of paper, you know. You, you know, someone, you know, and they, were, they would have the capability to send a message in Germany. And, and, um, and we would receive it in Saudi Arabia. Uh, I guess very, very early days, primitive email. Um, okay. There was no direct. So it was like it was coming off a machine someplace. And we would they would distribute them. I remember that. I don't even remember. I guess it came out of the, the G six, <coughs> but um, hmm. I of course, that. Yeah. mail. You're I getting mean, mail, free mail, and yeah. Uh, I mean, my, soldier and, mail and, and personal mail. My battalion was responsible for the post for for all postal operations, and yeah, any uh, free mail, any soldier mail. That was always great. I mean, the, the 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 thoughtfulness and the generosity of the American people just always been phenomenal. The uh, their um, the the cookies the uh, I remember the University of Nevada Las Vegas basketball team sent autographed pictures you know Jerry Tarkanian was the coach I, I can remember <laughs> that um, you know the, the cookies were all, always great you know um, the baseball cards we got the Desert Shield Desert Storm baseball cards I I still have some of those those yeah, are fun else, yeah. but and they came in the mail um, okay but but the postal was the, you know that that that's a great story because again, as I mentioned, the the, uh, the core staff got up to about eighteen hundred, geographically dispersed in um, three different three significant three big locations, um, and all the mail came into the rear, and we didn't have anybody in the rear pushing mail, and um, I mentioned to my uh, fiance at the time, who was the core strength manager, well she did that at night. During the day, she ran postal. Mm. Uh, she was she was she was a huge help. She found USAR soldiers that she could uh, help marshal the mail and get the mail pushed out from the rear to the main. And um, you know, she and I she was a huge she was a significant help for us. And then we get the uh, the mail at the main, and we'd push it down to the tack from there. That was easy. The tack was a, a smaller unit. Well, and so you mentioned that you had a duty of setting up the morale, welfare, and recreation type services. Mm -hmm. uh, but what about you personally? On the uh, it sounds like you were very busy, but did you have a little <laughs> bit of downtime? And what did you do with any free time? No, I had no, I had no downtime. Okay. As a matter of fact, I, I it was it was no kidding. It was eight weeks before I even took a bath. Yeah. And that was, of course, you know, good old fashioned stand in a tub and you know pour water on top of you, but. Uh, yeah, I was. It was. It was crazy. It was the uh, the most intense period of my life in my career was that time because um, even though fast forward to later on in Operation Iraqi Freedom, um, that was equally as intense in terms of hours. But at least there, there were some nice creature comforts. You know, I, I had a place where I can a, a, a nice containerized housing unit that I can go back and take a shower in. I could watch TV for a little bit in my in my hooch. Um, back, back you know back in Desert Storm, there was nothing. There was my trailer where I worked out of 16, 17 hour days, and then I would walk to my GP small and I would just you know crawl into my uh, sleeping bag and and then a couple hours later I'd get out of it and I would do the whole thing again. And like I said, I mean it was no kidding. At least eight weeks before I took any sort of and any okay. sort of significant personal hygiene. But you were yeah, and you you talked about the things that you set up. So let me, let me uh, switch tacks a little bit and uh, ask about your relation or first meeting with General Franks. Um, my first meeting with General Franks was uh, when he came in and assumed command of Seventh Corps. Um, <laughs> now, this is always funny because uh, as the HHC XO. And as the and then even later as the the, the uh, STB the Special Troops Battalion S one, you know I was I did all the in processing for for that team. Uh, his driver, then Sergeant Dave Saint Pierre, his uh, his enlisted aide, then Sergeant First Class Lance Sing Song, uh, his aide First Bud Th uh, General now then then Major then Major Gen ultimately Major General Bud Thrasher. Uh, Major Toby Martinez, who just passed away 
recently. So we did all the in-process and we got them all. But one of my responsibilities as the HHCXO was that I was the um, a drug and alcohol prevention control, Army Drug and Alcohol Prevention and Control Program, ADAPCP officer, which meant that when we had, it was time for your analysis, I was the guy that had to do them. Hmm. And so when we would do the core headquarters, we would actually, the leadership, you know, we would actually go up to their office and conduct, uh, conduct it there. So uh, that was, I think, my first meeting of General Franks is, is was conducting a urinalysis on him. In and his well, office. In his office. There you go. Yep, absolutely. Well, there you go. well good. Um, yeah, that was, <laughs> that was always fun. <laughs> um, I guess back on Desert Storm again, <clears throat> in addition to what you've already talked about, but is there any other incident that stands out as um, either something very frightening uh, or very unusual, or even actually the flip side, something very ironic or funny that occurred during Desert Storm for you? Well, I, I can remember, of course, uh, when the air war started. Uh, and I can remember just, you know, sitting outside. And um, I just thought of something funny, but I'm probably not going to share it. Uh, I can remember sitting outside and, um, and watching the air war happen from just on the back of my trailer wherever I was sitting, it was just incredible. Just the, you know, the lights in the sky that was, you know, that was as resulting from the air war. It was, in, it was just, just a, a spectacle to see. Um, I can remember the day, the, the night the ground war started. Um, and, and, you know, it's funny, I was just thinking about this the other day. For whatever reason, my battalion commander, who I love and adore, uh, he is my son's godfather, Lieutenant Colonel Rick Roche. For whatever reason, that night, he sent me up to the ramp. Uh, the ramp was what we called where the core, all the core headquarters mm -hmm. elements were, the G1, G2, G3, G4. He sent me up to the ramp to be in um, the op center to just be the battalion LNO, if you will. And so I got to hear the first, uh, I got to hear the first um, uh, missiles being fired uh, of Operation Desert Storm. Oh, wow. Um, oh, wow. Jeff Lieb's battalion, I mean, Jeff Lieb's company. I was there, you know, uh, listening to that. Uh, so I remember that. Um, the, uh, the first time they were told us to take our polybromine pr tablets, that mm -hmm. was uh, certainly um, something that was, a concern, uh, yeah, you know, yeah. I, I tried. I mean, obviously, I had a lot of young soldiers in my uh, in my S one shop, and <clears throat> the fact now at this point, Captain Rado is um, thirty three, I guess. Yeah, that's about right. Um, and so, I, I th the fact that I was older and more mature than those of my peers, I always thought that was a, a plus for me. So I, I think I was, I hope I was able to, you know, show a calmness to my soldiers that helped them. And though, cause in, in those very, in those times, you know, the ground war starting, the air war starting, the polybromine tablets. Um, and because uh, they were a great bunch, my S1 shop, phenomenal bunch. And, uh, and I wanted to make sure they knew that, you know, I was, I was calm and steady, so they had that to see. But yeah, I mean, and especially now, we, we look back, you know, 89-hour war, 100-hour war, and everything. We know how it all ended, but at the time, yeah, we, we didn't, didn't know, know how it was going to end, and we'd heard pretty high casualty estimates and mm -hmm. chemical weapons. Yeah, the and chemical the, the, warfare. The strength of the Republican guards and all kinds of things that could happen, so... The funny thing I just thought of a couple minutes ago is the, uh, so the way the Corps headquarters was arrayed, I'll leave the names out. Yeah, it doesn't matter. The way the Corps headquarters was arrayed, we were circular um, with a big berm, um, defensive positions arrayed outside the berm, um, and then it was, and then with inside, there was another inner berm, and that's where the Corps headquarters was. And then, you know, the outer berm, was staffed with the units in you know face of a clock 
where everybody was. Seventh Corps artillery was here, you know, uh, the Signal Brigade was here, you know, the, the personnel group, the finance group, mm -hmm. the special troops, but we, we were all arrayed around. Um, so one night uh, we're, we come out and it was uh, one of those nights where there just was no illumination yeah. whatsoever. Yeah. It was pitch, you could not see <laughs> your head in front of your face. And I'm outside the, the S3 shop van <clears throat> we had just finished one of our meetings, and so we had to wait for the battalion commander to come back after the core meetings were complete. Then battalion commander would come back to the battalion CP, and then we would have our meetings. What's going on? What's going on? What's next? What, what, are, what are we doing today? What are we doing tomorrow? That kind of thing. Um, and so after the meeting was over, myself and... Uh, the assistant three was by a guy by the name of Scott Hines, great guy, and um, oh, uh, Lieutenant Charlie DeGrudis. The three of us are sitting out by, and he was an individual augmentee that I picked up at the uh, replacement detachment. Mm -hmm. I probably mm -hmm. traded a, a, a stove for him, you know? but uh, he ran my PX. Um, we were no, no, no. He was in the three shop. Chris Brolin ran my PX. Um, so we're sitting out the back of the truck and we're just BSing, and all of a sudden you hear thump, 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 and stop. And we're like, what the hell is that? And then coming from the front of the truck around the back of the truck, here comes a guy, and he's all disheveled, pieces are all, all over the place. And um, he says, hey, uh, where's unit so-and-so? Um, it's over there, sir. It was a general officer from one of the units that had got himself lost so badly <laughs> that he ended up going over two berms wow. and falling over another berm, and, and luckily ended up right in our truck and uh, try, right behind one of our in front of one of our trucks, and we were able to get him. But I'll just never forget him coming around. <laughs> And he's all disheveled, he's all over the place. And, and he was by himself? Uh, yeah, by himself. Well, I guess he was probably uh, walking I, back I, from I, something. Or I whatever. felt bad for him. Yeah, so, I, but, I'd heard a couple of stories like that, too. Oh, yeah. Um, well, I guess for your Desert Storm time, did you receive an award? And uh, if so, what, what was your award? I did. I, uh, award? I, I, I received a, uh, well, we, we were, I guess, a couple of awards. We got a, I remember I received an Army Achievement Medal for all the preparation work that we did to get out of Germany. And then um, uh, while we were there, well, you know, as we completed our operations in Saudi Arabia, um, I got a Bronze Star Medal for my, uh, my, my service and my um, achievements while assigned in theater. Okay. Pretty cool. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. As junior officers back in those days. So they, my team came to pick me up at my hooch that morning. Um, and uh, there was a helicopter that was going to take me to uh, to Baghdad International Airport, and uh, we went up. We got to um, the helipad at Phoenix Base, which was adjacent to the uh, the Minsticky headquarters, which I knew very well because I had gotten to serve uh, as a, the acting chief of staff for about a month. Oh well, because um, the chief of staff. Uh, and a great air defender by the name of Randy Buheider went on Christmas leave. And so General Helmick chose me to be the chief for a month. And uh, it was phenomenal. What a great experience that was. Yeah. Um, I, I, I truly enjoyed that experience. And, and um, I learned so much that month as a chief. And, and it really meant uh, a great deal to my entire operation. And in fact... Uh, General Helmick awarded me a Joint Service Commendation Medal uh, for my uh, my month as the Chief of Staff. That was pretty cool. But yeah. so I, so I knew the headquarters very well, obviously, uh, as the acting chief and even as the J one. But so they uh, they they bring me to the headquarters and we go out to the helipad and there was about six or seven of my guys there, and the uh, the helipad uh, lifts off and the guys are underneath the um, the awning adjacent to the uh, headquarters building. And so I, as, the, as the helicopter comes up, I see them all. And as the helicopter rises just high enough, they all come to the position of attention and salute me. And I'll tell you what, 
uh, I started crying that moment. Yeah. I've actually got a picture of it too. I did get a picture of That's it. That's pretty and, cool. Uh, and it was just one of those emotional moments. It certainly reminded me of the closing episode of MASH. You know, it had yeah, that yeah, exactly. same connotation to it. Yeah. Hawkeye or BJ going up and, uh, or Hawkeye going up and BJ seeing, you know, had putting out goodbye. Uh, and uh, so it certainly reminded me of that. And, uh, and then to buy app, uh, Baghdad International Airport, where I got on um, whatever, a C-141, or I guess, or a C-130 to take me um, back to uh, Kuwait. It was great getting to Kuwait. I can remember, I can remember that was just a pretty cool experience, especially, you know, I, I often joked, you know, uh, I went to war as a captain, I went to war as a colonel. It was way better going as a colonel. Sure. It just was, you know, uh, air-conditioned tents, even, you know, and air-conditioned hooches and showers and, you know, just all the nice, the creature comforts that really made life bearable and made life, you know, good uh, for us. Um, and, you know, I wasn't the only one with that stuff, obviously, but... Um, Would you get a first-class seat on the flight from Kuwait to uh, wherever you went? Yeah, uh, we were Air Force Air, and uh, and I did. It was, um, <laughs> or, or we were on a, a commercial jet, rather, mm -hmm. uh, run by the Air Force, obviously, and, and I did. It was, uh, it was nice. But then we went back into Benning because I had um, come out of Benning. I had gone through the... Uh, the Conus uh, Replacement Center there at, at Fort Benning and went back into Benning and one of, <laughs> one of my E5s from my battalion had now gotten herself, uh, went to Officer Candidate School and she was a lieutenant now and she was working in the, G in the, S in the G3 shop at Fort Benning and so she, uh, she certainly helped and made sure everything was uh, expedited for me. I mean, I literally went through... Um, redeployment processing in a couple of hours. I, I, I had been a protocol, I had been a, a general's aide in a previous life. Um, and so I had, uh, I had reached out to the protocol officer at Fort Benning who I knew, and I was able to reserve the Marshall House uh, for my, uh, my one night at Fort Benning, and, uh, which is their VIP quarters. Mm -hmm. and, so it was very nice. It, it was actually a home owned, lived in by George Marshall at some point, um, and uh, and then um, they put they put me on a plane. Uh, dro they, I remember I drove up to they put me on a, in a van up to Atlanta, and then Atlanta uh, back to Washington D.C. And yeah, it was uh, an incredible. It was just incredible to be back. At the time, I was assigned to ICAF. I was still at ICAF. Okay, yeah. So there was no great homecoming, you know, celebration like we had in Operation Desert, Desert Storm, but it, it was it was it was great to be back. And I think within within uh, within a day, within two days, I was uh, on my way to New York, and uh, I think I left I think I left Iraq on August the fourth, and on August the eighth, I was in Yankee Stadium. Watching a ball game. On leave. Yep, so so on you leave. didn't have to do that formal half day reintegration for seven to ten days mm -mm. and station training. No, nope, no. Nope. As an in, as an individual augmentee, yeah, there was there was, you know, there was not a lot of that. You yeah. you know, they, they I remember, you know, anything you want to talk about, you fill out the forms. Uh, do you need to see a, a, you know, men, any med any medical issues, any mental health issues? Yeah, I remember filling all that out. Was that and, just you kind of got that treatment, or was that kind of the no, standard for everybody? I, yeah, for individual augmentees. Yeah, pretty. Yeah, I, fast. especially for those. Okay, so an individual augmentee going back to Fort Knox, Fort Campbell, Fort Bragg was probably significantly different than an yeah, individual yeah, going going back to Washington DC. Very unusual to the, situation. To the probably. to the Industrial College of the Armed Forces. They were like yeah, they probably didn't know what to do with it. Exactly. Exactly. Right. Okay. Um, and and you know, but you know and, and but they were great. You know, they they were phenomenal. I mean, you know, there was not no significant delay in getting me out on leave and you know, I took my leave like I said within within four days of going from Iraq going maybe five days from Iraq, I was at Yankee Stadium. Cool. Well, so we're 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 closer to the end than the beginning. Oh, no, this uh, has it's been great. Been a great interview. Fascinating great memories. talking to you. So I've got really just three questions. One of them is a catch-all at the end. But the the third to last question is, and, and I know you went on to a, a full 30-plus year career 
uh, retired, of course, and still working. But how would you describe how your overall Army experience, but specifically your combat deployments, have affected your overall life? <clears throat> My two combat deployments, um, Operation Desert Shield, Desert Storm, as a captain, Operation Iraqi Freedom, as a colonel, um, both doing generally the same thing, Army Human Resources, uh, taking care of people, were both some of the, you know, they were both the times of my career, times of my life that I'll never forget. <coughs> the, um, the things we did as an organization, uh, as an army, as, as a corps in, in Desert Storm, as a, as a, a three-star joint command in, in um, or Operation Iraqi Freedom, you know, had a significant effect on how we live today. Um, there were tremendous experiences that I wouldn't trade for a minute. They taught me a great deal about myself. They, you know, they taught me um, that I could, you know, that I could do just about anything. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the the op tempo that we kept up, and in, in, you know, even in, in even with the creature comforts in two thousand eight. You know, it was still, you know, crazy op tempo. I mean, we, you know, we, I can remember days when, um, you know, obviously I think it was an eight hour time difference, if I remember correctly, between um, Baghdad and Washington, D.C. And I can remember days when I was still at work and people in Washington, and I would be calling people in Washington, D.C., and they'd already left for the day. But I was still there, and it was an eight hour time difference. Um, mm. And uh, it was just, you know, crazy, you know, trying to synchronize efforts with those back in the States, with those back in Washington, D.C., maybe, in, you know, in Europe. Um, you know, we, I was always dealing with uh, the CRCs. I was always making sure that people were getting pushed. Right. People weren't getting held up. Um, so the, 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 the ability to synchronize uh, efforts with the significant time differences was certainly a challenge. But, um, but again, it was just, it taught me more about, those, those two times taught me a great deal about myself. Okay, no, that's a, that's a great answer. Um, and now this is kind of thinking about kids <coughs> and, and grandkids and future great-great-grandkids or maybe generations of your, your, your descendants that don't even exist yet. Uh, but for the record, what, what would the, be the one thing that you would want these future generations to know about you and your, and your military and wartime service? I think what I'd like him to know is that um, I had a father that taught me what this country is about, <clears throat> what it means to be an American, and, and the price that we have to pay to be an American. Um, the, 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 the value, he, 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 under, he explained to me what the value of service is. And I guess I would like them to know, excuse me, <coughs> that when my nation called, I was there. I, I stood up, I, I, I did the things that my dad taught me were important to do. I did the things that were important for me to do. I served my nation, I continue to serve my nation. I, uh, I, I was happy every day because I was loving what I was doing. There was nothing better than taking care of soldiers. And that's why I continue to do it today. Well, I think that's again very, very well said. Well, then, so, so, Mark. Then the, the the last question is the proverbial last question. Is there anything else that you wanted to include, or more detail, or that we, we went over too fast? <laughs> I I was blessed. I have I have been blessed for my entire career. I was in the right place at the right time so many times. Um, the, the last two jobs, you know, the last two jobs I got, uh, being the G1 of the Army's executive officer and having the opportunity to work for General Jim McConville before he became the chief of staff of the Army, before he became the vice chief of staff of the Army, and then ultimately, ultimately the chief of staff of the Army. Um, I, I got that job because circumstances the, that I had nothing to do with, uh, opportunity opened up, and, and I jumped at it. Um, the job before that, same thing. 
phenomenal job to be the deputy, the adjutant general of the army. Um, circumstances happened, the job came open, and I jumped at it. And I guess, you know, the the, the, the takeaway from me is that um, is that don't ever ever be afraid to take a chance. I mean, I could have, you know, I I could have stayed there at Fort Knox, Kentucky, in two thousand. 14 and um, and not moved to Washington DC with less than two years left in my career to take a job that I knew was going to be you know probably one of the harder jobs in our career field right. um, and and I knew the intensity it was going to be uh, but that's what I wanted to do I I, I often um, use the movie Rocky there's a point in the as a little kind of connect the dots for me there's a point in the movie where um, Rocky, it's right before the fight, and uh, the, the fight against Apollo, and Rocky's uh, back in his apartment, and he's with Adrian, and he, and he can't sleep, and he gets out of bed, and he goes down to the spectrum, and he's looking at the posters. He's looking at the big banners, the murals, and he looks at, he looks at the one of him, and he sees that the shorts are the wrong color. And so in comes the fight promoter, Mr. Jurgens, Miles Jurgens, and he yells down, this is late at night, he yells down, Rocky, what are you doing here? And Rocky looks up, he goes, Mr. Jurgens, the poster's wrong. What do you mean, Rocky? Well, the poster's got white shorts with a red stripe, but I'm wearing red shorts with a white stripe. So Miles Jurgens calls down and says, Rocky, does it really matter? We know you're going to give us a good show. So Rocky goes home. He gets back in bed with Adrian. And he says, I know I can't win. But I just want to go the distance. And that's why I did what I did. I knew I wasn't going to be a general. I knew I wasn't going to get selected to be a general. But I wanted to give everything I had until the bell rang. I wanted it. And when the bell rang for the 15th round of my career, I wanted to come out, tap gloves, and fight, and that's what I did, and I wouldn't change a single minute of it for the, anything. Well, cool, and you're and you're still serving now. I am. Well, Mark, and I should have probably said this in the beginning. I think this is the first time we've done an interview with someone who does not live in the United States. <laughs> uh, Mark's currently living in Germany, uh, serving still with the with the army. But uh, Mark, this has been an extra special interview for me, based on our, our friendship and. Uh, Professional relationship. You were part of managers. you were part of some of the decisions that yeah. got me to different places. But so I do want to thank you personally thank on you the very record, much. Thank and you. then uh, we also want to present you our museum coin. Oh, that's awesome. Freedom specific. Maybe hold it up to the camera. That's phenomenal. That really and, is. Uh, yeah, it really we're, means we're, a lot. We're, uh, we're pretty proud of that organization, and and we're also really like the partnership that we had this weekend with uh, with you as the president of the Seven well, Free Desert and I, and Association, I, and hopefully I, next year as well. I, I will tell you, as the president of that organization, uh, uh, which is you know, a phenomenal organization, which was born of war, uh, which has continued to serve and continue to uh, honor the uh, memory of the 111 soldiers that we left behind, that uh, both the United States soldiers and soldiers from the United Kingdom, um, it's an organization that I'm so very proud of. I'm proud to be the president of. And this weekend, the, the things that we did that were new, whether it was the Desert Storm Veterans Forum that we did or the connection with you and your organization uh, and tying you and AHEC together to, 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 you know, to team, to partner, to get uh, these oral histories on record. I can remember at Command and General Staff College, um, I had my, his, my history teacher was, his name was, I'm pretty sure it was Chris Garber. I'm pretty sure his name was civilian instructor. And I remember him saying that, that he was, his, his, I guess it was his dad. His dad passed away before he had the opportunity to do this. So I am so glad to have the opportunity to do this. Uh, you know, someday uh, Mark Jr.'s son or Gregory's son or daughter, or, uh, you know, they'll have the opportunity to, see this and say, oh, that's what that guy looked like, huh? That's what he sounded like. But well, no, we'll this is important to me. See you yeah, you exactly. bet, you bet. So I appreciate the opportunity to do this, and I appreciate the partnership. And I, of course, 
appreciate your friendship since, uh, what, like 1995, 96, yeah, yeah. something like that. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Mark.